Okay, so hot tape. Um, I feel like this is, uh, this is a really hard session. <laughs> I was talking to Anna Sale in the back, and she's like, wow, this is hard. You have to cover this in 40 minutes. Um, and so what I did to prepare for this is I actually crowdsourced it um, among my company at Gimlet Media, and I had a bunch of people give suggestions. So these, hopefully, this is like the accumulation of the wisdom of everyone at Gimlet. Um, okay, let me just, so the, before I get to that, my name is Lisa Chow. I'm the host of Startup. Um, we are in our sixth season. Yes, sixth season. Holy cow. Um, okay, so uh, first thing, know what you're looking for. Um, the way uh, I think about this is, you know, there are three, there's like building blocks for hot tape, um, and three of them primarily there are the anecdotes that you want to get from people. So that's just sitting down with someone and having them tell you a story, beginning, middle, and end. There's reflection, so that's having them kind of actually have an emotional reaction to the story that they're telling you, or having not even just an emotional reaction, but just like a, a, a thought about it. Um, and hopefully it, it, it is honest and authentic and it feels real. Um, and then there is something that I call live tape. And live tape is, you know, some people might call it scene tape, but I, I actually have a kind of, a, we have a narrower definition of what I think live tape is, is like ideally you're in a moment with your subject where a critical thing is happening. So oftentimes, like with people that I'm spending a lot of time with or interviewing, I'll actually ask them, like, do you have something that you're working on right now that could be a big inflection point for you personally? If there's a big decision that you have to make or a big kind of moment where the stakes feel very real for you, can I be there when that's happening? Um, and what's nice about that tape, uh, and I actually, like, it was not, it was really at startup where I realized like the power of this tape, because startup season one was very much about the founder of Gimlet starting Gimlet Media, and you know he was he had the microphone with him at all times, and he was recording, you know his pitches to investors, he was recording um, his negotiations with his co-founder, and like that tape, there was something very special about it because embedded in that tape was suspense, like you really didn't know what was going to happen, so. Um, I personally love live tape. So anecdotes, reflections, live tape. Um, two, it's OK to audition people for your story. OK, so this is not everyone provides good tape. And it's good to recognize that quickly and move on. Um, and so oftentimes for stories, we will pre-interview a ton of people to get like the person who is, can tell like the anecdote in the best way, who is, feels real and honest and emotionally vulnerable. Um, but it takes a lot of filtering oftentimes. Even, even when you're doing like man on the street, you know, I, I, I have done a ton of like Vox Pop. When I'm on the street in New York City interviewing people, I, if I find someone that feels special, I spend time with them. And if I, see, if, I, if I start talking to someone who just clearly is uncomfortable, is not very, you know, is not wanting to talk, like, I move on. I let the per I don't, I don't try to kind of pull it out of them. Uh, okay, let's see. Next is ask and ask again. So I'm going to play a, t a piece of tape for this, um, for this because I think this, this piece of tape uh, is incredibly special. Um, it's one of my colleagues at Gimlet. Her name is Shruti Penamini, and she is a producer at Reply All. Um, and the thing about Ask, Ask Again is that it, it, it can take multiple tries to get the tape that you want. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to think if I should tell you a little bit about this, what I should tell you about this clip before I play it. So this is a story that Shruti did. It was a four-part series that she did for Reply All. It's called On the Inside. If you haven't heard it, you should listen to it. It is an amazing 
series. Um, and basically what she does is that she profiles a guy, and initially her interest in, this, in the character of her story is because he, he writes a blog from prison. Um, he actually dictates his blog to his mother, who, who then posts the blog <laughs> online. Um, and he is in prison uh, for a murder. And then so the, the series kind of launches into re-examining this case. Um, and she is in the car, in this piece of tape that we're going to listen to, she's in the car with a guy who basically was one of the key witnesses in the trial, um, who put the guy behind bars, um, Paul. Um, and this guy she's interviewing is Bob. And Bob, there's, there's questions about his involvement in the murder. Um, so I'm going to play this piece of tape. And then we get to the night of Dean's murder. Bob just completely, his whole energy shifts. He's suddenly uncomfortable. He's fidgeting, shaking his leg, starts to keep turning the heat on and off in the car. Can you tell me, Robert? Can you, can you just tell me? Tell you what? Tell me what happened. Oh, um, this here is all under, I, I don't want to get into this again. So this you is, don't want to talk about? I don't want okay. to talk about that. You're, again, this, you're opening a can of worms in my life. I am opening and a can of worms. Very, I'm very sorry. I feel, no, no, you're no, doing, I feel You're doing bad. your job. Again, I'm not, I'm not upset. I'm, I don't get upset like that. Um, I'm just wondering what your, what your point is on doing this. Actually, actually mm -hmm. now, how do I know you're not a PI? How do I know who you really are? Can you're asking you? some wait, serious wait. questions. I'm sorry. And I don't know why you're asking these questions. All right. Can I show you this? <sighs> This is a story I did in January. Comment, like, something you... Hi, I'm PJ Vogt. Okay, here. Um, we're here because Shruti Pinamanani has a story for us. Yes, I do. Um, so... Okay, Shruti, I don't have to you listen to this. Do you want me to tell people what's going on? I don't have to listen yes, to this story. I'm sorry, I just said I'm, I'm not a PI. Look, no, no, okay, besides that, I'm I'm, I'm, you're asking me questions that are really, really detailed at this yeah. time. Mm -hmm. These are some questions that a cop would ask me. I'm not saying you're a cop. But these are some very, very serious questions. Can I? I'm sorry. I can see you're getting upset. I'm really, not, no, trust no, no, me. I'm no, no, not no. upset. I'm, no, no, I understand. Uh, okay. This is hard stuff. This okay. is hard stuff. So, so listen, I seen. I'll, I'll tell you something. There are a few things I don't understand with this, with this whole... The, the trial, the, the prosecution's position. Come on, yeah. leave this in a yeah. car. Leave Sorry. this in a car. Uh, come outside. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we get out of the car at this point. Bob is just shaking all over. I tell him, listen, I have questions about the night that Dean died. I have to know what happened. And he says, I can't talk about it. It's too traumatic. I, I can't get these images out of my head. Eventually, you know, he, he calms down. We get back in the car. I don't want to get into details of, of what happened that night. Okay. I just um, want to tell you this. This is uh, something that uh, I don't care about what these cops cops say because they don't. They live a different life. They, uh, uh, this poor kid, this poor kid, that's all I can say. If it makes, you know, if they, uh, I don't even know how to say it. Which kid, Dean? Yeah. <sighs> Nobody in this world deserves anything like that. Nobody. Okay, so, um, so I talked to Shruti actually before this uh, session about how she got this tape. And the story is pretty unbelievable. <laughs> um, so first of all, the guy, everyone told her, like, you're never going to get Bob to talk to you, okay? Because he, there was questions about actually whether Bob had killed this guy, Dean. Um, so everyone's like, you're never going to get Bob to talk to you. So she, she, it was very hard to track him down. She found a bankruptcy filing um, with an address on it. So she went to that address. It was in Chicago. She went to the address, and um, she saw a mailbox with his name on it. And she actually hand-wrote a letter and put it in the mailbox. And she was on her way out of Chicago, and she got a call from Bob. And she told me that she could tell, like, in that moment. And, and you know, she said, she's like, I'm on my way to the airport, but, but like, I want to talk to you, so let's do this now. And because she knew that if she gave him, like, a little bit more time to think about it, she might miss her window. So she actually didn't 
get on that plane. She went back to a spot. She met him. And, you know, they were doing this interview in Bob's car, uh, and everything was going swimmingly. It was like, you know, she's just, you know, he was chatting it up. He was incredibly charming until they get to the moment of like the night of the murder. Um, and she said he got really agitated. Um, and basically, you know, you know, you hear in the tape, like he's getting, she describes that, they leave the car and she kind of explains what she's trying to do. You know, she's like, I, I, this is what Bob says, the, the other guy who's serving time, you know, um, I just want to get your side of the story. Uh, so they go back into the car. He's still incredibly, like, basically she wasn't getting the tape that she wanted because she said he felt paranoid and he was very guarded and was very different. And she needed reflective tape. She needed tape that was going to kind of help, help tell his side of the story. Um, so she actually decided to just take a break. She said, you know what, this is not working. Um, let's go and get dinner. <laughs> so, so, they, so they basically kind of called it quits for the moment. They went out and got dinner, and like he was with his girlfriend, and she was there. And, and it just like to kind of put him at ease. And then she went again. She tried again. Okay, so that's what I mean by ask, ask again, ask again. I mean, this was like, I think, above and beyond. Um, but she said in total she had four hours of tape with Bob, which basically was edited down to uh, about three and a half minutes. But yeah, that is, that's intense, okay? <laughs> so, um, but like, just a great story, and I, I think that, you know, shows, you know, when you, when you with persistence, um, and with a key character that you want, you know, uh, you, can, you can actually get, get some great stuff. Okay, next. Okay, recognizing common impediments of good tape. Okay, so uh, three impediments of good tape. Your, your kind of subject or interviewee is an evader, someone who doesn't answer your questions. A rambler, someone who is going off on all these different tangents and is also like not answering your questions, but thinks they're answering your questions. Um, and the speedster, someone who talks really fast. And so, you know, it's like you, you, you need them to actually just kind of tell the story and walk through the story and give the level of detail that you need. And they're just like rambling through. I mean, they're, well, they're, they're like speeding through it and not giving the level of kind of detail that you need. So the solution for all of that is to basically kind of take control as an interviewer um, and just basically say, you know, stop them, take the mic back. Like if they're evading, you know, just kind of like basically take the mic back and say, hey, you know, I, you know, I, I, I need you to answer this question. Can you answer this question for me? <laughs> um, it might feel a little awkward, but I actually think that sometimes it, in this weird way, it can put people at ease when they feel like they're with someone who kind of like knows what they want um, as an interviewer. So, I mean, this has happened to me all the time and, and like, especially when I need to kind of recreate a narrative that's happened in the past, like recreate an anecdote that's happened in the past. You know, it's like I need them to kind of walk through like that day or that like critical moment in their story. And they're just like, they're just like they can't, you know, they can't focus or they're just speeding through it. And it's really just like slowing them down. I'm saying, okay, explain that one more time to me. And also sometimes in the second time around, when someone tells their story a second time, they're actually better. I know that sometimes we feel like, oh, if you didn't get it the first time, like the first time is most authentic. But oftentimes, like the second time is sometimes better. Um, okay. Okay, Yeah. This was one of my building box blocks of, of great tape, one of my favorites, um, live tape. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to play a, a cut uh, of tape for this one. <clears throat> and this is a story that I did uh, for um, season three of, of Startup. And I, I was following a guy who, uh, who had been a drug dealer um, in New York and, you know, grew a, actually a pretty substantial business in New York uh, selling drugs. 
and was caught and served seven years in prison. And uh, some of that time in solitary confinement. And uh, he was, you know, leaving prison and really trying to restart his life. And he was starting a business. And uh, he was pitching at this pitch competition in Las Vegas. And actually at the time, you know, it was Alex Bloomberg, who was my editor at the time, he basically said, are there, you know, like, you should go to this pitch competition. And I actually, I don't know why I didn't think about going. I was like, I w because I was so focused on, like, telling the past, like, his rise as a drug dealer, his arrest, his, like, his change over to the new business. And this was, like, a, an opportunity kind of staring me in the face. And I, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. Go to the pitch competition that he's going to be at. Um, so I went, I flew out to Las Vegas uh, for this competition. And he was up against, you know, um, some pretty, like, impressive companies. Uh, and he was also the only, uh, there was one other, there was like 10 people, and there was one other person of color in the, in the uh, you know, uh, in, uh, among the contestants. And she had, you know, graduated from, like, Columbia and Yale and, you know, UChicago. So, and he, you know, hadn't gone to college. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so he, so he felt like he was kind of up against a lot. Uh, and I was able to, he was, I mean, this is about access. So live tape oftentimes is about access, like getting people to agree to let you be in the room when they're doing something very nerve-wracking, and that's hard. Um, but yeah, he, allowed, he basically let me sit backstage with him as he was going to pitch in this competition. And he actually also pulled number one. So he was like the number one person up to pitch. Um, so this, that's the backstory to this tape. It was just addicting. After a while, it was just like, I need to smoke. And then it'd be like, once you smoke, it's like calming. And then it's just, it was just something to do to It was just like, I rolled another blunt. It was like a cigarette. You know, it's just like, so I'm asking him about um, what he, what would he do to relax as a drug dealer when he was doing was, stressful was deals. Then now it's not. Do you ever wish you could roll another blunt? No, no, I don't. I don't know. I don't really care about it anymore. I just I have so much, so much other things on my mind, like growing this company and just making things happen that I don't have time to like relax and smoke a blunt. I mean, there's times where I'm like walking down the street and I smell, smell like some purple haze or sour diesel. I'm like, damn, that's just good, you know? You know? But it's only like a, a feeling that you get for five seconds and after that you just walk away and forget about it. But, yeah. Koss looks down at his phone. What is it? He just got a text. Um, somebody sent me like a, a passage like Psalm 54, verse 7 to 11. I don't even know who this is. It's just weird in Spanish. Can you read it? What it can you translate it for me? Pienso que quien me diera a las palomas para volar y posarme. Me guía lejos habitadas en el desierto. Like God, just like God of... He would like guide me. Um, he would let me fly like a bird. He would. Um, he would like guide me through the desert. He would save me from the tornadoes and the hurricanes. He would save me from the torments of the like lion's lung. He sees the violence, and day and night he'll make his round, just making sure that we'll be safe. How are you feeling? I'm okay. I'm okay. I feel better. I'm ready. You know, it's funny, I just like, in seeing you read that, it kind of changed 
your demeanor. Do you feel any change? I do. I guess that was my marijuana there. Yeah. Yeah. That calmed me down. Everything's gonna be okay, no matter what. So, um, yeah, that was like five minutes before he went on stage and had to pitch uh, for $100,000. Um, yeah, so, so uh, you know, it's, it, 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 what, what's nice about that, I mean, you know, that moment, if I had just interviewed him without kind of the scene, it wouldn't have been nearly as powerful, right? It's like you're setting the scene of, you know, this is about to happen, and then in the story, you know, he walks on stage, you hear the pitch, you know, so there, there's also something nice about kind of the, behind the veil type thing, you know, like you're getting an insight into what's going on behind the scenes, which is always exciting, I think. Um, okay. Silence. I love silence. Um, it's something that I have had to work very hard on because actually I'm not very good at being silent. <laughs> um, but. I, I, in, I'd say, like, in the last couple of years, I realized that, yeah, I mean, half, half the battle is just not interrupting someone, like, when they're saying something. Um, because I think that oftentimes, you know, silence is very uncomfortable for, for, uh, for the interviewer and for the interviewee. The comfort is actually good for the interviewee. You kind of, in some ways, want them to be uncomfortable sometimes because then... They want to fill the silence, um, and sometimes when people want to fill silences, they actually say more than they maybe intended to. Um, so uh, yeah, so just like you know, now pretty much after someone ends a sentence, I always give a beat, like I don't jump in. Um, and I remember like early going, geez, I just would listen back to my tape and I'd be logging my tape and so many times I'd be like, why did you interrupt them? Like they were just about to say something. Um, so it's like after years and years of interviewing, realizing that just, you know, let them finish and give them a beat, you know? And sometimes they'll actually say something kind of shockingly honest right after that, that beat. Okay, twice is usually better than once. Okay, so this is a little bit different from the ask again and again and again. Um, and, and oftentimes we don't have the luxury to do this because we're on deadline. So, um, and it's only actually been in my last job where I've actually had the luxury to do this. But um, going back for a second day. Like if you, I mean, you know, recently I traveled to Pittsburgh and I was... Um, interviewing uh, a guy who, who is like very, you know, he, he's kind of impenetrable um, in terms of, like everyone told me beforehand, like that this guy Red has no emotions, no emotions, you know? And um, so I was preparing myself for that. Uh, but, you know, it is actually amazing when you have a second meeting with someone, if you have the luxury to do that, because it's like they've warmed up to you and there's been some trust that's been built in that time. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like you, it's hard to imagine. I mean, you think about it, like a stranger comes up to you and kind of expects you to share, expects you to share kind of their, your life, like your fears and your hopes and your dreams, you know, in that first meeting, in that first encounter. That's pretty crazy to like that actually people do that. Um, and, and I'd say that like most people probably don't, do that very, very well. Um, some people do. Some people are like very honest and upfront in that first encounter, but a lot of people just need some warming up. So if there's a chance to actually go back to them for another day, and just to, to not even just, I mean, I'd say like give some time, like, you know, I mean, it, it, if you do a morning, you can do a morning session interview and be like, hey, let's like reconvene in a couple of hours. Um, it doesn't have to be the next day, but if you can get a, another chance, that's always great. Okay, getting someone in the present tense. Um, so I'm gonna play a clip for this, which is uh, from one of my, uh, uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, Lisa Pollock. 
um, for, this is for season two of Startup. Um, getting someone in the present tense is like just, you know, actually getting them to speak in the present tense. Like, I was doing this, and, or actually, that's just past tense, but like <laughs> thinking through, getting them back into the moment when they were experiencing the thing, you know? Um, and that's actually really, I mean, it depends. Like, I, I've, I've noticed that sometimes if I'm talking to someone um, and something's happened to them a very, very long time ago, they actually don't have the memory sometimes. So, so sometimes you actually, even to just prepare them for like, oh, you know, you know I'm going to ask about this thing. So if there's things that can jog your memory about that incident, um, even sending them that ahead of time sometimes helps. Um, but Lisa in this piece of tape did something that I thought was like really smart. Um, and uh, so this is a, this season two uh, for startup, we covered a, a dating company that was founded by two women. Um, and this was an episode about raising money in Silicon Valley as women. Um, and the two founders had actually very different views about uh, the challenges. And one of them kind of basically said, you know, Silicon Valley is, is sexist and that's why we're not getting money. And the other woman, um, you know, sh she was like, well, maybe we don't have a good business plan and, you know, all these things. But they also had this, they also had, like, the one who was more questioning of whether it was, like, their gender that was hurting them or just maybe they just didn't have a good business, she also had an incident with a potential investor um, where he basically, like, as he was offering her money, he kind of touched her in a way that felt inappropriate. Um, and so she is kind of reflecting about this experience. And the way Lisa got her into, like, into real reflection about that moment is she got her to read a blog post that she had written about the incident. And so I'll play this. It was a big decision to make, and I couldn't stop questioning whether I was exaggerating what happened or being too sensitive. My co-founders immediately assured me that wasn't the case and that we could not take the money. They said it was ridiculously inappropriate, that our relationship with him would only get worse, and that we should hold out for better investors to partner with. And so the next day, I sat down and wrote the investor an email. I told him that while we appreciated the offer, we were being very strategic about which investors to partner with. It felt pretty gutsy at the time, but since time has passed, I couldn't be more confident about the decision. <laughs> Why did you just laugh? Well, because I am not so confident about the decision. <laughs> um, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Um, it, I, I feel really uh, stupid about it. I feel really really embarrassed for not taking the money like maybe I made too big a deal of it and maybe it like wasn't an issue or maybe like this is just how the world works and I'm like being a baby about it um and I feel that but but intellectually I know like if you told me that that happened to you I would be like what the fuck like we have to tell everyone he's a creep like you did the right thing you know like I know what I would say to to my friends if they told me that story um yeah I mean what I love about this piece of tape I mean you know first of all she gets her in the moment by actually just having her read this blog post um and and I actually you know it's funny I learned this trick very very late <laughs> I learned that trick really in season two because there was so much so many kind of weird like documentation that we were able to collect from this company. I mean, they had a lot of like customer surveys and stuff like that. And just like getting them to read stuff. I didn't, I didn't even think about like, oh, that's, that's actually a way of getting good tape is getting them to read things that are good, you know, that are interesting, um, which was kind of a brand new idea to me. But like, I, I also loved how she asked her right, like, you know, Emma is laughing in this kind of uncomfortable way and it's weird, and she's laughing, obviously, to kind of cover up some, some deeper feeling. And a lot of people would have just let that laughter go and been like, ha, ha you know, laughed along with, with their interviewee. 
But Lisa Pollock just asked her, like, why are you laughing? You know, explain why you're laughing. And, and that was, it's kind of a little bit going against what you want to do as a human. <laughs> I think oftentimes as journalists or as reporters, like, you actually do have to go against your natural instinct to kind of, because you're, you're putting them a little bit on the spot. But, but that was, I thought that was just like this really great moment. Um, and then also just like being, but also being human, you know? It's like when she starts to cry, you know, Lisa is not, you know, she, she, she says, I'm sorry, you know? She's connecting to her um, as a human. And, and, you know, my favorite moments of tape are hearing like the, 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 re, the kind of interaction between a, an interviewee and an interviewer. I mean, like everything I've basically played for you is, is, is that. Um, so finally, so we have time for questions, which is nice. Uh, okay, this is, is like very common sense, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely not, you know, I think it's worth saying, is just being interested, you know? Like being excited about the story that you're reporting um, and, and just like, if you're not excited, figuring out how to get excited uh, uh, and, and just being genuinely curious and listening to people. I mean, I really think that that is, like, that's a very powerful action and it will lead to kind of powerful moments. Thank you. So. Questions? Hi, my name is Sharon. Ooh, that's Hi, loud. Sharon. And my question is, do you have any other additional tips about prepping a potential interview subject? In my case, it's someone who's a friendly subject. They're willing to talk to me. But trying to help them kind of think deeper about what it is that you're going to question. You're talking about bringing them back to that moment, maybe giving them some ways to kind of prompt their memory, but any other tips you have for preparing your subjects? Is there something specific that you want from them? Like what? I want them to actually tell their story. And one thing that I'm finding is that not everyone's a great storyteller, so they, right. they will leave out some of those details or they won't they'll sort of gloss over things or they'll start to talk philosophically or jump ahead to what it meant to them rather than actually getting into the meat of what happened and living in that moment and telling the story. And when you say a story, I mean, are you, do you have specific anecdotes that you're trying to kind of get them to retell? Well, I let them pick them, but it's on the theme of when they were trying to help someone and the challenge they faced in trying to help that person. So I tell them ahead of time to think of a couple of stories of examples right. that they have. But then when they come to me, often they'll have one that's a little bit better developed. And then ideally I want two. So then they'll have another <laughs> one that they're like, oh, yeah, and then there was this other time and this happened. And that teaches us a lesson about this. I'm like, Right. Have you tried? I mean, I'm just wondering, like, the per so you're, you're trying to get them to tell stories of how they help someone. Can you bring that, the person that they helped into the room? Not currently with my current budget and okay, <laughs> constraints, okay, okay. But, but yeah, I mean, I think I was thinking about ideas of could I at least try to find things that they've already said about it or ways to prompt their memory about it based on what you were saying. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just wondering whether it's just about like not, like trying to get them more relaxed. Mm -hmm. So sometimes even having someone bring a friend, mm -hmm. you know, who will be able to nudge them, someone who knows the story really well and can kind of prompt them, like, as they're telling, I was like, oh, remember this? Like, oh, yeah, well, what about that? Do you remember, you know? Um, and so if there's actually specifically someone that they've helped, like, maybe bring that, the person that they've helped into the room, um, it might help, you know? Because it, just having the environment where you feel kind of comfortable... I was going to say, yeah. and alcohol. I didn't think about that. That idea. could help, too. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had advice about fielding a conversation between multiple people at the same time and yeah, how to make hard. sure that both of them are talking and discussing, but also if you need them to interact with each other and not just kind of yes, 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 each other. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think it de- so it depends on the relationship between the two people. Are, are these two people like strangers or are they, do they know each other? Are they friends? Um, they, they know each other and worked with each other. And you're just trying to get them to have a conversation together. Yeah. And I know they have differing views and it kind of makes it difficult that they know each other because they don't want to step on each other's toes. But I'm trying to get that kind of healthy descent that they have. Right. And it's just hard to have them to feel Have, have you actually just told them this is what you're trying to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> because you just might say to them, like, just directly, like, you know, I want you to have a conversation that feels real to the... the I mean, I, it sounds like if they disagree about something, you know, like, I want you to really kind of express the values that you have and I know that you have kind of different values on this particular issue, and I'm trying to kind of help demonstrate that and kind of show the, the different points of view here. And so, like, I want you to feel comfortable to disagree. You know? I mean, yeah. you might just, just I, I'm, it's just a suggestion, but you might actually just tell them this is like what you, you would like to happen, ideally. <laughs> So thank you for your comments. My name's Erica. Um, I have a show where I talk to fairly successful people Uh and ask them deep questions about spirituality, about kind of emotional complexity. Um, And oftentimes they're very well media trained. Yeah, Um, that's hard. So I want to talk about your point about rambling. Do you have any tips or tricks on how to control well-trained people so they aren't rambling, they aren't giving you like (laughs) their boilerplate spiel um, besides just, like, spending a lot of time with them to get them comfortable with you? Yeah, I mean, that, that's very hard. Um, I don't have any, like, quick tips on that. Um, I tend to avoid those people. <laughs> um, it's, like, in the self-selection process, like, those people get kind of filtered out. Um, but, I mean, I, like, I also would be very direct about just the fact that, I mean, you know, I, I've interviewed a lot of like CEOs and founders, and it is, it, I, I think, just saying like, listen, I. <laughs> it's, I'm trying to. Remember, the last time I did this was in season, um, season four, which where I, I, I profiled the CEO of. Uh, American Apparel, the former CEO of American Apparel, where I actually had this conversation with him, even though he actually, you know, he was quite vulnerable and quite open on tape, but. Um, where you're actually just talking to the person saying like, listen, this is what I'm trying to do. Um, and, and this is what you can do to make this easier, you know, essentially. Like the way that listeners connect to you is by you expressing kind of an authentic moment and an authentic feeling. You know, so, um, I mean, sometimes it's hard because if you give instruction a little bit too much, I mean, I actually, I tend not to coach a lot. I've seen other reporters do that quite a bit um, where they'll actually really coach someone through um, through their anecdote. And I don't, I, I tend not to be very heavy handed in that kind of way. But but sometimes just saying like, listen, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to, to I want our listeners to connect with you. Um, and if you're giving me a spiel, that that's not going to feel that's not going to feel real you know so if there's like if there's any way like you know maybe we maybe maybe it's like find a story that they haven't told before you know like is there a story you know that illustrates this point that you haven't told before that's not like a story from your back pocket thank you yeah hi i'm elizabeth and you said that you audition possible interviewees yes so what is your ask so that they know up front that it's possible you're not going to use, use them? Um, yeah, I make it very clear. Like, we're, uh, I mean, you know, it's, the thing is that I, I want everything to be on the record, typically, unless, unless, I'm really, unless I'm really going for information as opposed to, um, it, like, if I'm trying, if I'm, I, I will go on background at times, but I, so I tell everyone that the inner, that the conversation we're having is on the record, um, but that, that we may just use it for background. We may not use it for tape. So I basically just made that clear. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question kind of goes along with that question, but how do you 
get to the point where you have so many people to talk to, <laughs> you can say no to some of them. I mean, I'm just having, I'm, I'm looking for people to talk, um, interview about a specific subject. It's a sensitive subject to some people, and I don't want to interview all of my friends. I want to interview people I don't know. Yeah. Um, so what, what are some ways to reach out to people? I mean, it's a lot of cold calling and like finding, you know, it's all kind of, it, well, it depends on the topic, obviously. You know, it's like for, you know, one season we were, you know, covering Dove Charney, we were talking about sexual harassment. So we were talking about women who had either felt like they were having consensual sex with, with Dove or, or, or you know, non-consensual sex. And that, that was very hard. You know, it's like we didn't have a lot to pick and choose from because it's like it was hard to get anyone to talk for that story. Um, but I think that it, it is just like calling, I mean, we, we scoured the papers and all of the legal documents to see what names we could find. And then every single person we talked to, it was like, can you name like five other people? Can you give me five other names of people that I can talk to? Um, and so it just like, it spreads exponentially, like you're, the number of people, um, but you use your sources to provide other sources. Um, and then, and then you have, you know, then you can have quite a number, <laughs> but, but it does take time. I mean, you know, that, that was a project that was done with a team of, uh, five producers. So, so, you know, it's like a lot of people making a lot of calls and digging up numbers and every single person they taught, every single person they talked to is like, give me more names. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and my question is a little bit more centered around uh, the dynamic between in a setup where you have a host and producer. So yeah. you were talking about um, pressing and asking again. Yeah. And sometimes being outside of the actual conversation, you have a little bit more of objectivity that you can identify, oh, they didn't really press in. Do you have any suggestions about how to, like, it, it's, it's a mix between interrupting and, and a flow of conversation versus going back to a topic where you know, you know, you have a hunch that there's more to it, but the host didn't necessarily pick up on it. So do you have any thoughts about how that could work um, out? Oh, okay. Well, sorry, I'm telling you. Okay. So this is the last question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, oftentimes, especially if I have a producer in the room with me, um, I always say like, hey, you know, we're going to have a conversation. And at the end of this conversation, my producer is going to have follow-up questions. So what's nice about that is um, I could have totally missed something, you know? And it's just like I didn't land this moment, and my producer is like pulling his or her air out thinking, why didn't you ask that follow-up? Like, idiot. So at, I always give time at the end of every interview for them to jump in and be like, Lisa, can you ask this other question and this other question and this other question? And so you're not breaking up the flow you know, like, it's a natural conversation happening between me and an inter interviewee, but, like, there's an opportunity at the very end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have to present our next, our next session is what to do with the hundreds and hundreds of hours of tape that you'll have. Um, and it's, our presenter is Molly Webster, who is a producer and guest host at Radiolab. It's me, I'm not Molly. We have a 10 minute break. Molly's on at 2.45, so if you need to do a thing, do a thing, but come back at 2.45 sharp for Molly, okay? Yay.